Welcome to the teaching ministry of Calvary PSL. Please join lead pastor Mike Wiggins for the message, The Security of the Beloved. All right, well we've come to the end of Jude's inspired letter, by the way, which has both warned us and encouraged us. And so Jude, he, he warned us, right? Like crazy, he's been warning us, beware of false teachers, don't be deceived by false teachers. He's warned us and he's also encouraged us. He's encouraged us to build ourselves up in our most holy faith. He's encouraged us to keep ourselves in the love of God. Now we noticed last week that that phrase, keep yourself in the love of God, is in the imperative in the Greek. That means it's a commandment to Christians for the last 2,000 years, including you and I. We are commanded by God, keep yourselves in my love. And so how do we do that? We learned last week that we got to follow the three present participles that surround that commandment in the Greek. And so by way of review, how do we keep ourselves in the love of God, which by the way is a direct quote from God's word in verse 21. How do we keep ourselves in the love of God? How do we keep that commandment? Number, number one, here's the first present participle. We gotta continue to build ourselves up in our most holy faith. Number two, we gotta continue to pray in the Holy Spirit. And number three, we gotta continue to wait for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. And so if, it's a big if, right? But if we follow these three exhortations, it'll be like putting spiritual kindling on the campfire. <laughs> How many campers do we have here? Let me see your hands. I just don't understand you guys at all. Why would you ever wanna sleep on the ground when you can go to a hotel and sleep on a king size bed with a pillow top mattress, right? I just don't, I don't get it. But anyway, for you campers, maybe this will mean something. If you're sitting there around the campfire on a cold night and the fire is diminishing, what do you do? You throw more kindling on the fire, right? And the more wood you throw on the fire, the brighter and the hotter that fire becomes. Now I want you to understand something. God's love for you is like a blazing inferno. God's love for you absolutely never changes. But if you want your passion, if I want my passion to burn hotter and, and burn brighter for the Lord, then we gotta continue to put on the spiritual kindling on that fire, we gotta put the stick of building ourselves up in our most holy faith. We gotta put the stick of continuing to pray in the Holy Spirit. We gotta put on that stick of eagerly waiting for Christ's return. So God's love, it will never change for you and I. You can always count on it, but our passion for the Lord, it kinda does this, and so Jude just told us last week how we can be blazing for the Lord in our hearts in a fallen and cold world. Does this make sense to you guys? That was last week, that was verses 20 and 21. This week, we're starting in verse 22. Jude is switching gears, and in verses 22 and 23, he is going to show us um, a few different approaches on how to reach others with the truth. And so right now, if you are looking at Jude verse 22, can you say amen? So important you follow along because what we are reading right now is a million times more important than what I say. God's word says, verse 22, he's talking about different approaches to reach others with the truth. Truth. Here's approach number one in verse 22. And have mercy on those who doubt. Approach number two in verse 23. Save others by snatching them out of the fire. And then approach number three, to others show mercy with fear, hating even the garment stained by the flesh. Okay, so Jude reminds us right here that we can't just be concerned about our own relationship with the Lord. We can't just be concerned about putting the sticks on the fire. That's great, but ladies and gentlemen, we also need to be concerned about other people and about their relationship with the Lord. And so right now, in those two verses, Jude gave us three ways to approach others with the truth. All right, approach number one is the soft approach. 
Approach number two is the strong approach. And approach number three is the guarded approach. Our job is to pray for discernment so that we use the right approach with the right person. All right, so we're gonna start with the soft approach again in verse 22. He says, and have mercy. Can you guys shout out the word mercy, please? Mercy. Have mercy on those who doubt. Here's the bottom line. Some people struggle with doubts concerning the Christian faith. And by the way, they have sincere questions about the Christian faith, okay? So what should our approach be with those people? Should we like blast them out of the water because they had the audacity to question the Christian faith? Is that our response? No. How should we respond? Mercy. <laughs> he just said it. Have mercy on those who doubt. Compassion. Kindness toward them. Isn't that how Jesus treated Nicodemus, by the way? Nicodemus, that member of the Sanhedrin, he came to the Lord one night and he had some sincere questions about who Jesus was and what in the world Jesus was teaching that was turning his world upside down there in Judea and, 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 and in Galilee. And so unlike his peers, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, many of whom just rejected Jesus outright, no, Nicodemus saw something special in the Lord. And so what did he do? He made an appointment, so to speak. He came to Jesus, he met with him, and he asked him some sincere questions. Now during the conversation, if you remember this from, Jude, from John chapter three, you know, um, Nicodemus just wasn't getting it. It's like Jesus was speaking on a spiritual level, but this guy, even though he's religious, he's still a natural man, he's never been born again, and so they're kind of missing. Okay, I have a question for you. When Nicodemus wasn't getting it, did Jesus just like, sternly rebuke him and blast him out of the water? No. He challenged him for sure. He didn't blast him. Jesus said, truly, truly, I say to you, unless you are born again, you're not gonna see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus, you need to be born again. And later in the conversation, Nicodemus just admits it. He says, and I quote, how can these things be? He had doubts. <laughs> People have doubts, all right? And, and so what do they do? They need to have room to ask questions in order to alleviate their doubts. And the last thing that they need is somebody in authority, whether it be a pastor or a minister or a small group leader or a parent or whatever, to blast them out of the water because they're asking sincere questions. Jesus spoke the truth in love to Nicodemus. That's what we're called to do. Speak the truth in love. Be kind, be compassionate. And apparently it worked. Because apparently, Nicodemus became a follower of Jesus before it was all said and done. And the reason I believe that is because before Christ died, Nicodemus stood up for the Lord Jesus publicly in the face of his peers, the Pharisees and Sadducees. In the Gospel of John, Nicodemus took a public stand for the Lord, and then after the death of Jesus, Nicodemus, along with Joseph of Arimathea, prepared Jesus' body for burial, and they buried him in Joseph's tomb. I don't think someone who's rejected Christ would have stuck his neck out and risked the ridicule that he no doubt received for those two acts. I think Nicodemus was born again. <laughs> By the way, if you haven't seen the first season of The Chosen, and let me see your hand if you've seen the series The Chosen, yeah, I think there's about 40%, which means 60% of you are missing out. I'd really encourage you. That's, by the way, Peter's face, the guy who plays Peter. Um, it's a series. You can stream it, and I encourage you to watch it. Now, I'm gonna prepare you in advance. It's not gonna follow verse by verse through the Gospels, uh, but my, my wife and I really enjoyed it when we watched it, and I think season two is coming out next year, and so there's a little resource for you. Jude gave us three ways to approach people with the truth. The soft approach, and now number two, the strong approach. We see that in verse 23. Okay, so look at, look at verse 23. He says, save others by snatching them out of the fire. That's what you call the strong approach, and that's what some people need. And so the most famous example that I could think of of the strong approach um, was administered by a preacher named Jonathan Edwards. Jonathan 
Edwards. We'll put his picture up on the screen. Edwards lived during the 18th century. And he was one of the most influential voices in what we call today the first great awakening, an amazing spiritual awakening that occurred where thousands and thousands and thousands of people uh, came to the Lord. And so his most famous sermon, by the way, was Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God, which was a powerful message. And the reason we know it's powerful is there's still people talking about it today even though he gave the message way back in 1741. I mean, 200, about 80, 280 years ago, and still people are talking about this message. And so, in vivid language, Edwards described the lost being held over the pit of hell by a thread, a thread that could break at any moment. And this is what Edwards said. And by the way, you compare the preaching back then with the pop psychology-based preaching of evangelical American churches today, and it's night and day. But Edwards said this. He said, oh sinner, consider the fearful danger you're in. He's speaking to people who are outside of Christ. And the most loving thing you can do for people who are outside of Christ is not to pull punches, not to water down the truth, not to deny that there's a hell. That's not helping anybody at all. We got to hold to all the cardinal truths of the, of the New Testament, of the word of God. And so, O oh sinner, consider the fearful danger you are in. It is a great furnace of wrath, a wide and bottomless pit full of the fire of wrath that you are held over in the hand of that God whose wrath is provoked and incensed as much against you as against many of the damned in hell. He says, you hang by a slender thread with the flames of divine wrath flashing about it and ready every moment to singe it and burn it asunder. He said, it would be dreadful to suffer this fierceness and wrath of Almighty God one moment, but you, the person who's outside of Jesus Christ, you must suffer it to all eternity. There will be No end. When people heard that message, many of them were deeply convicted by the Holy Spirit. Some people wept in their seats. Other people began to cry out. Other people looked for something to hold on to, like a chair rail or maybe a column of the church because they were so affected spiritually by this message, they didn't know if they were gonna die and fall into hell at that moment. And so after dangling them over the pit of hell with his words, here's the good news. Jonathan Edwards snatched them out of the fire with the beautiful gospel, ladies and gentlemen, that Jesus saves. That God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And so some people, and by the way, his whole message, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God, can be found at Blue Letter Bible at that awesome website that I'm always recommending to you. And so people love to ridicule hellfire and brimstone preaching. But my contention is this. Didn't Jude say that we need to save some, quote, by snatching them out of the fire? You see, we need to use different strokes for different folks. Jude gave us three different ways to approach people with the truth. The soft approach, the strong approach, some people need just to wake up and smell the coffee. And by the way, how many of the people right now who are in hell and they can't change that forever wish to God they were sitting in the seat hearing the good news of the gospel that Jesus saves right now? The worst thing we can do is to water down the truth and say hell doesn't exist like some quote unquote evangelicals are doing today. And so the soft approach, the strong approach, but Jude gives us another one, the guarded approach, and that's in the second half of verse 23. Please look at it. He says, to others show mercy with fear. The idea there is like dread, extreme caution. You know, keep your guard up. Hating even the garment stained by the flesh. And so as we reach out, right, to help people, we're gonna find that some people are gonna be involved involved in certain sins that are 
may tempt us personally. And so we gotta keep our guard up so that we don't fall. You see, if you've had a problem in the past with heavy drinking, and there's a person who is engaged you know, in heavy drinking and they're getting drunk on a regular basis and you're trying to help them and you've had that past, be careful, keep your guard up so that you don't fall back into the same thing that you used to do. By the way, did you guys know the Bible absolutely clearly says drunkenness is a sin? It's very clear. If you've had a past with drug abuse and you're dealing with someone who's got an addiction, be super careful, keep your guard up that you don't fall into the same sin that you used to be involved in. If you've had a past of looking at pornography or inappropriate movies, and by the way, how many of you guys know those are increasing exponentially in our perverted culture today? You gotta be so, so careful when you're watching TV today. But if you're dealing with someone who's involved in being defiled by that sin, keep your guard up so you don't fall back into the same thing that God helped you get victory over by the power of his Holy Spirit. You see, this is why Paul said this in Galatians. He said, brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Look at this. Keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. And so as we reach out to help others, we gotta keep watch on ourselves. We got to be guarded. I mean, how many boxing matches have you watched where just for a split second, the guy puts his guard down and what happens? Boom, he's on the canvas like that. And so we gotta keep our guard up as well so we don't fall into the same sin that's defiling the person we're trying to help. And if you're with me, say amen here. We gotta keep our guard up so we don't fall for the person we're ministering to. This is why we encourage here at Calvary men to minister to men and women to minister to women. This is why pastors and elders in this local church, if we're counseling a female, there needs to be another person in the room or the door needs to be left open um, here's what you need to know, ladies and gentlemen, too many counseling sessions have ended in affairs for us to just like take this matter lightly. And so, yeah, we gotta speak out about it. Do you, you know this? Roaches run when you turn a light on. So why don't we just turn the light on? And why don't we have some, some rules so that we don't become the next article in the newspaper? And so all of us are people helpers, whether we're ministers or, or members, we're all supposed to be in the people helping business. And so we all need to be careful with our relationships with the opposite sex. And if we're married, it's very healthy to keep our spouse in the loop about the ministry and the people that we're ministering to. That's just healthy. By the way, Billy Graham was amazing, amazing at what I'm talking about right now. And guess what? He got all the way through the end, he finished well. Praise God for that. And so we wanna be people of integrity. We wanna be people of integrity and we wanna follow Jude's advice at the end of verse 23. He says, to others show mercy with fear. Look at this, hating even the garment stained by the flesh. Now that phrase right there, the garment stained by the flesh is super, super graphic. Um, Dr. John MacArthur, one of the guys I read almost every single week, uh, he had this to say, John MacArthur, in his commentary. He said the word garment refers to the clothing people wore under their outer tunics. Okay, and so you continue to read his commentary, he comes right out and says, Jews talking about their underwear. And then if you couple the next word, polluted in the Greek, with that idea of garment, Quote, the idea there is to be stained by a bodily function. Are you guys getting the picture here? Maybe you don't wanna get the picture here. <laughs> As we reach out to help people who are being defiled by sin, Jude literally says we need to hate the underwear that's been stained by a bodily 
function. And so ladies, if you're doing laundry, and by the way, I guess I always have to say this, by that statement right there, I'm not saying that only women should do laundry, okay? So don't send me emails. <laughs> Guys, we could pitch in and do a load every once in a while ourselves, right? Oh yeah, I hear the women saying amen. But just for sake of illustration, ladies, if you're doing laundry and your husband's been working out in the heat and he comes in and he takes off his drenched T-shirt that stinks and is stained in the armpits and wants you to take it from him and put it in the washing machine, what are you gonna say? I don't care if the Bible says wives submit to your husbands or not, you're putting that in the washing machine. I'm not touching the thing. Now for some reason, I don't think Jude was talking about underwear. I don't think that was his point. He's speaking metaphorically. And so when the plain sense makes good sense, seek no other sense, unless you get nonsense, okay? So we're not talking about underwear here. What are we talking about? If you're with me, say amen. amen. Jude wants to tell us this. Just like we would hate the sweaty, smelly, stained T-shirt, so we, so we should hate the sin that's defiling the person we're trying to help. And if we really view it like a dirty, stinking, sweaty T-shirt, if we really view their sin like that, maybe we'll think twice before we put that T-shirt on ourselves and get involved in the same sin that they're involved in or fall for the person that we're ministering to. We gotta keep our guard up, because as soon as we do this, boom, we're on the canvas. And how many of you guys know the devil's like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour? So thank God for Jude who calls it like it is, who shines the light so the roaches run. And now we finally come to the last two verses after six weeks of verse by verse study, the last two verses in Jude. So right now if you're looking at Jude 24, can you say amen here? This is absolutely beautiful, by the way. He says, now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless. Can you say the word blameless there? That's amazing thought there. I have it underlined in my Bible. And to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy to the only God our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. And all God's people said, amen. amen. What beautiful language. And so Jude ends his inspired letter with a doxology. All right, so what's a doxology? Got questions. Tells us. The word doxology comes from the Greek doxa, which means glory, splendor, and grandeur, and logos, which means word or speaking. And so a doxology is a statement of praise to God. A statement of praise that happens either when we're talking or we're singing about God's glory and God's majesty and God's dominion and God's authority. This is why I love praise and worship in the local church. Because when we gather here together as a church family, what are we doing? It's like a big doxology to the Lord. We're singing statements about his dominion, statements about his authority, statements about his glory, right? statements about his majesty. And how does God respond? The Bible says that God inhabits the praises of his people. It's no wonder you sense God's presence during the singing portion of the service. Why? Because you and I in these rooms are extolling God and it's his majesty and his glory. Which by the way, they're not doing that in the culture. Have you noticed? Nobody's talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. No one's singing about his glory. No one's talking about the cross. You say the name Jesus in the culture and people get all weirded out. But that's what we're called to do. We're called to speak a doxology, sing a doxology to the glory of our God. What are we embarrassed about? What are we ashamed about? People need to hear about the Lord and his glory. And so Jude ended his letter with a statement of praise. And in that doxology, in that statement, he gives Christians like you and I two assurances. Here's the first one, if you're taking notes. True Christians, and I have to say true Christians because some people think that they're a Christian just like they think they're American. <laughs> 
and they're greatly deceived. But true Christians, I'm talking about born again people, can be assured of God's constant care in their present situation. Jude said it. He said it in verse 24. He said, now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling. And I love that because it tells me that God is not just willing to keep us from stumbling, but God is able to keep us from stumbling. In other words, God's shoulders are real big. His biceps are like bulging. God is so powerful. God is so strong. God is so mighty that he is able to constantly keep you in his love and his care, constantly keep you and I from falling. That's what he does. He's involved, he's intervening, he's working. I love the fact that God is omnipotent, right? That means that he's all powerful. But I also love the fact that God is omnibenevolent. That means that he's all good, he's all charitable. And I think what a great combination for God. The one, the only one in the whole universe who's all powerful. Good news everybody, he's also all good. Can you imagine if the only one in the universe who's all powerful was evil? We would be up a creek without a paddle. But the good news is that God, the eternal God, the uncreated God, the first cause, the uncaused cause, he's all good. And he's always there, present, in order to love us and help us. If we'll just reach out to him. My wife Stacy and I love going to the mountains as much as we can when we can, we like to go up to the Smokies, we like to do the trails, and it's a special treat whenever we come upon a river in the woods. And by the way, you gotta be super careful around those rivers. How many of you guys have ever tried to cross a river on the rocks, right? It can be pretty slippery. And so crossing a river can be tricky unless you have some help. And I have no doubt that that little girl made it across that quiet little stream safely. Not because I have confidence in her ability, but because I have confidence in her daddy's ability, because I know that her father is able to keep her from falling. And just like that daughter can count on her father's constant care in her present situation, you and I can count on our heavenly father's constant care in our present situation. God is able. God is able to keep us from falling. He's able to keep us from stumbling. He can get us across the river of life. But ladies and gentlemen, we gotta reach out and ask for a little help. The problem comes when someone thinks they can cross the river of life on their own, right? I don't need Jesus. That's just a crutch. I'm a self-made man. (laughs) All right, have it your way. Pardon the bad English, it ain't gonna end well for you. Can Can I tell you the truth this afternoon? We all need the Lord. We all need the Lord. My concern is that some people come into these services and they sit and their wall is up. And they're hearing, but they're not listening. Because their hearing is not mixed with humble faith. Luther taught us, you gotta actively listen to the word of God with faith. That's when faith comes alive. But how many of you guys know the Pharisees heard Jesus all day long with their arms crossed and their walls up and faith in most of their hearts was never awakened. And they were religious and they died and they woke up in hell. Why? Because God wanted it. God is not willing that any should perish but that all should come to repentance. But he's not gonna force himself on people so I encourage you to listen humbly. I encourage you to listen with faith, and I encourage you not to have the attitude, I don't need all this stuff, I'm a self-made person. No, we need the Lord. And Romans 10, 13 says, whoever 
calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. True Christians can be assured of two things. God's constant care in their present situation, but also, this gets me excited, God's glorious presence at their future destination. Can you guys imagine seeing God and living through it? Theologians call it the beatific vision. I can't wait. Now, where is that found? That's found in verse 24. Look at it again, please. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you, can you shout out the word blameless? Blameless before the presence of his glory with great sorrow, no, great joy. Now, let me ask you a question. How many of you guys would admit by raising your hand that you have sinned, you're, you're a sinner? Let me just see. Yeah, I'm gonna wait for everyone's hand to go up. <laughs> and I'm gonna raise two, just so you know, okay? All right, so here, here's the question I, I pose to you. How in the world can we as sinners ever expect to be presented blameless before Almighty God? I mean, think about how holy God is. Think of the fact, as I said a little while ago, he's the uncaused cause, he's the first cause, he's the eternal God, he's always existed. He's omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent, omnibenevolent, he's eternal, he's sovereign, he's the great I am, okay? And so how in the world can we expect as sinners to stand in the presence of such a one? The only way, the one and only way is if we receive the forgiveness that he offers through his son, Jesus Christ. You see, when we hear the gospel, and then we personally believe the good news that Jesus Christ is the son of God, that Jesus paid for our sins on the cross, we personally receive him as our savior and Lord. God justifies us, that we're justified. Thank God it was rescued in the Reformation by men like Luther and Melanchthon. It means, here's the definition, if you're with me, say amen here. Get this, don't ever, ever, ever forget this. The word justification means that God declares us righteous by our faith in Christ. <laughs> Justified. And it's all because of Jesus. Paul put it this way. God made him, the Father made the Son, who had no sin, to be sin for us? Are you kidding me? Is that not love or what? He didn't have to do that. He became sin for us, so that in him, we might become the what? The righteousness of God. I'm talking about our self-righteousness there. That's talking about God's righteousness there. It's a staggering truth. God made his sinless son to become sin for us. Peter said it this way, that Jesus bore our sins in his body on the tree. And so your sin, my sin, put on Christ. Now, please understand, quick theological clarification. When Jesus became sin for us, he did not become sin ontologically. What that means is that he did not, in his sin nature, his essence, his being, he did not become sinful. No, we're talking judicially here. We're saying that Jesus offered himself as our sin offering, and when he was on that cross, he paid the price of death to the judge of the universe. Not to Satan. Jesus didn't owe Satan anything. He paid the price of death to the judge of the universe, God Almighty. And so here's the gospel right here. We'll start at the lower left corner. There we are, sinful man. Sinful mankind. And you know what? God could have just left us that way. But how many of you guys are glad that God is a God of grace? And so what did he do? He imputed our sin, ascribed our sin onto his son, who is both righteous man, never sinned, and holy God. And Jesus Christ, the good news, is that as he hung on the cross, he died for us. In other words, God accepted his sacrifice on our behalf, and God's righteous anger against our sin 
top right corner, was propitiated. That simply means satisfied. God is angry with sin. God hates sin, and sin's gotta be paid for. You guys help me out. The wages of sin is death. Somebody had to die. And Jesus said, I'll do it, because I don't want all these beautiful people to die and go to hell forever and be separated from, I'll do it. And so he hung on a cross. He didn't have to, but he did. And he satisfied the wrath of God against mankind's sin. And because of what Jesus accomplished in his death and his resurrection, now, top middle part of the screen, the triune God, one God, one essence, three persons, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, the triune God offers forgiveness to sinful men and women like you and I. And when we turn to Christ in repentance and faith, when we understand what he did for us and we know, Jesus, you did it for me. You paid my payment. And we receive him as our savior and Lord. Guess what? God says, justified. He declares that we're righteous. He clothes us in the righteousness of Christ. And ladies and gentlemen, that's why we can stand blameless before a holy God. That's the only reason why, because we're justified by faith. Does this make sense to you guys? This is the gospel, which I don't get it. It's being neglected in churches today. But man, we have to, as long as we have breath in our lungs, we have to preach this gospel and somebody says, all right, pastor, but what if I lose it? And you know what breaks my heart is that there's so many born again Christians who live in fear that they're gonna die and go to hell. And it just breaks my heart. And so here's the good news. If you're justified, you can't lose your salvation. If you're part of the beloved, you're eternally secure. Or said another way, if you're justified, you will be glorified. <laughs> I want you to see it with your own eyeballs. Because again, I don't know, maybe in this room, there's people who still have this fear. They're gonna go to hell. You gotta get past the fear. <laughs> so I want you to see it with your own eyeballs by turning to Romans chapter eight. Romans chapter eight, and we are almost done, but please stay with me to the end here. Romans 8, 28. He says, and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are the called according to his purpose. And here it is right here in verse 29. And I want this to be, um, I want you to participate with me here by shouting out some words when I tell you, okay? So verse 29, here it is in black and white. For those whom he, shout out for new. He also, shout out the next word, predestined. predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that we, I'm sorry, in order that he might be, Jesus might be the firstborn among many brothers. The idea there is the preeminence of the eternal Christ there. Verse 30, and those whom he predestined, he also, shout out the word called. And those whom he called, he also, shout out the word justified, <laughs> declared righteous. And those whom he justified, maybe, <laughs> if they work hard enough, is that what it says? No, 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 no. Those whom he justified, he also, shout out that last word, glorified. Okay, so is God able to keep us from stumbling? Is God able to present us blameless before his glorious presence with great joy? The answer is yes. Why? Because of what theologians call the golden chain of salvation. Here's my last illustration and we're done. I had you shout out the words straight from Romans 8, 29 through 31. And there they are right there, illustrated in a golden chain, which is unbreakable. And here's why. The chain is not dependent on our performance. The chain is dependent on his promise. Do you believe God's a promise keeper or a promise breaker? He's a promise keeper. All right? So those he foreknew, what does that mean? Foreknowledge, that means that as his beloved, before time began, God intimately knew you. And then the next link, predestination. What does that mean? It is our destiny to be conformed to the image of his son. The third link, called. 
And so as the call, the Holy Spirit drew us to Christ through the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And then the next link, justification, my favorite word, when we believed, and I do believe it's a choice, when we believed, he clothed us in Christ's righteousness and he declared us righteous. And then the fifth link, glorification, that one day, beatific vision, one day we're gonna rise from the grave with glorious, immortal bodies, no more death, no more sorrow, no more pain, and we're gonna be able to stand in God's very presence. We're gonna be able to see him with these glorified bodies and not melt away. No, we're gonna be able to, with exceeding joy to enjoy this amazing vision of God all because of what Jesus did for us. That's your future. That is your future. That's something you can look forward to as a Christian. Our identity in Christ is mind-blowing. Our inheritance is amazing. The problem is, it's like, we don't even focus on it. We don't concentrate on it. And so if you're justified, guess what? You will be glorified because that chain can't be broken. And because of that, last verse, we can join Jude and we can say to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory and majesty, and dominion, and authority before all time and now and forevermore, amen. And that ends the book of Jude, the apostles' doctrine, which will build us up in our most holy faith, amen? I wanna encourage you, keep building yourselves up in the most holy faith. Keep praying in the Holy Spirit and keep eagerly waiting for the return of Jesus Christ for you, his bride. He loves you, he died for you, he's praying for you right now. God is for you, God is not against you.